Just a warning, this video will have lots of spoilers, obviously. However, I won't cover anything from Sumeru until the end, and I'll give a warning before then as well, so you can watch up until then if you haven't finished the Sumeru story yet. The character being dead is a pretty big reason to think that you might not be able to play as them in the future. Now, to be fair, Honkai Impact has had playable characters canonically die in the story before, so really not even death may stop a character. The only thing that seems to certainly be a nail in the coffin is if they have an NPC model, which actually there's one character I'll be covering that isn't dead, so I guess that's really the two categories of characters we'll be covering. But why don't we start with someone who's both? Tepe was the start of a new trend in Genshin, of introducing an NPC for us to get too attached to, to only have something bad happen to them in the end. Except for Enjo, I guess. He's chillin'. But lucky for us, Tepe had a delusion, so making a moveset for him is at least possible, unlike some other NPCs. For the basic details, I feel like Tepe would be a 4-star. Sorry bud, but I don't think you'll outrank your general. Hydro. And Polar. Tepe is the only character I'm covering in this video where the type of element is unknown. So I was excited to overanalyze Tepe's ideals and match that to an element. But then I remembered that he actually had a delusion. Which means he either picked whatever element it was or it was just given to him arbitrarily. But either way, I'm not letting that stop me from picking Hydro just because it matches the Divine Priestess of Watatsumi. Hydro is associated with justice and he... The reason why it'd be Hydro doesn't really matter now, all that matters is that I want him to be Hydro. As for his actual kit, I wanted him to kind of be a support that can deal damage, like Noelle or Songonomiya, because he inherently just wants to help people, but the way he does that is by pushing himself to fight hard enough to surpass the Traveler. But still, he ended up taking a delusion to do this, so his skill and burst would take a bit of his health. Polearm users just like hurting themselves, I guess. Tepe's skill would take some of his health to create a soft shield that simply reduces damage taken instead of preventing it. But to make up for that, it would have a more offensive twist. At the end of its duration, it would explode out into hydro damage that scales off of how much damage you took while the shield was active. For his burst, take some health to initiate it, but this would just be a huge attack boost to the whole party for a short while. I think this would scale off of Tepe's max HP. You gotta have something scale off of HP for Hydro characters. Unless you're Child. Or Mona. Oh, also his charge attack would be the upwards slash style of polearm charge attack. I did investigate how other Watatsumi soldiers fought to take into consideration with Tepe. But then I decided that I shouldn't go to the specifics of the normal attack animations. So the best I can put that knowledge to use is to say, I didn't see those soldiers doing acrobatic spins. Ah yes, the other dead delusion holder, and the biggest case of copium in Genshin Impact. It certainly isn't impossible for her to become playable. I don't think it's happening unfortunately, but let's just cope a little harder and see what she might be like. Five star, like all Harbingers likely will be. Cryo. Catalyst. These I think are pretty self-explanatory, though the element is a little interesting. A senora's actual vision is Pyro, but she primarily uses her Cryo Delusion because the Pyro she has is too strong and burns herself and everything around her. She'll be Cryo, but I do have a plan for the Pyro side. Anyway, because she's a Catalyst, that means I do have to explain more about her normal attacks than I would otherwise. Her normal attacks would just be homing projectile butterflies like the ones we see in her boss fight that fly around mostly as decoration. Her charge attack would be an ice spear crashing down like that other thing from her boss fight. Most of her things will just be taken from her boss fight. I was comparing child's transition from boss to playable, and besides a couple big attacks, it's not all too dissimilar to his playable form, just obviously weaker. So I'll mostly just tell you how Senora's moves are different from their boss fight counterpart. Senora's skill would place an ice trap. You could aim where it goes. This trap would explode and deal cryo damage after some time, or immediately if someone steps on it. This skill would have three charges as well as a really quick cooldown. You're going to be placing these all over. Now her burst changes literally everything. 
Her burst will put Senora into her pyro form for a short time duration. While in her pyro form, Senora will take continuous damage. You may have been wondering why Senora doesn't seem to have the same gimmick as Tepe did where using a delusion takes health. That's because it seems like either the Harbinger's delusions are special or the Harbingers themselves are special because they don't seem to suffer the negative effects of delusions that other people do. But even if they did, for Senora, her vision is much more damaging than her delusion. I was almost considering not working in Senora's pyro form at all because I don't think they would if she was playable. But I figure it'd be a lot more interesting than just making her burst a large AoE of cryo damage or something. While in her pyro form, her auto attacks are all pyro, her charge attack is now the pyro whip, though it doesn't create any lingering damage on the ground like it does in the boss fight, and her skill is now a quick tornado of pyro that draws enemies in like an animo ability. With her burst, she'd be able to create her own reactions, though I'm sure the pyro damage she deals in her ult would have to scale with cryo damage boosts or something because otherwise your artifacts would only be helpful half of the time. I'm kind of interested to see how, or if, they would deal with Senora's pyro side. It's just a shame she ended up experiencing the Musono Hitotachi. Tomo. That's not his name, but Hoyoverse refuses to tell us what it is, which implies something more might happen with him, but I don't want to say Kazuha's friend this whole time. So, Tomo it is. I think he'd be a 5 star. He gives me that energy, and the kit I designed for him kind of requires it. We also already know that he's an Electro Sword character. His charge attack would be a multi-slash dash forward, though probably a bit more reckless than Ayato's looks. In fact, the designated Tomo simp that I have in my staffing department known as Friends told me that she imagines Tomo's fighting style to be like Mugen from Samurai Champloo, so a lot more of a brash fighting style while mixing in some non-sword attacks. That is until his skill, where Tomo imbues his sword with Electro. Here his animations would change to be entirely sword slices, though still probably just as rash as they would be normally. This whole animation change alone justifies him needing to be a 5 star. His charge attack would change to just a single slice forward to reference the one time we saw Kazuha use Tombo's vision. The electro imbuement would only last a short amount of time, and each attack during this time would generate a ton of electro particles, which would be quite helpful for Tomo's high cost burst. Now, Tomo's whole thing is that he wanted to see the Musuno Hitotachi because he was fascinated by it and thought someone could deflect it. But an important part of that is that he died to see it in person. So he certainly didn't do anything as impressive as deflecting it. But he's hot, I like him, and this is like his one thing. So I figured Tomo's burst should at least reference the Musuno Hitotachi. The way this would happen is that his burst is just a single instance of huge damage. He'd slash the sword in a similar shape to what we saw on the Musuno Hitotachi, but a little sloppier. Of course, there'd be no massive pillar of thunder afterwards either. It's just the slashes and then just a bunch of damage. And on top of that, for each enemy Tomo killed with his Musuno Hitotachi imitation, it'll refund him a bit of energy. No real good transition from Tomo to Halfdan. This is just the last one before the Sumeru character. Haftan is quite interesting, because he's basically a what if the Black Serpent Knight was playable. He'd be a 4 star. I know he's from Conria, which is pretty important, but that didn't stop Kaya, and unfortunately I think Haftan is a little less important than Kaya. Also unfortunately, that was the easiest part of Haftan's basic details. For Element, Animo seems like an easy answer since it's the element of his enemy form. And admittedly, that's what I went with. But that's only because the other options that I think would be more correct would be impossible to proceed with. Haftan most likely wouldn't have a vision at all. I don't think anyone directly from Conria did. The only powers Haftan might have would be those strange powers from beyond that Dainsleaf has, but I've already talked about Dainsleaf's power before. And as for a moveset without elements, I also talked about that in the same video. So for the sake of treading new ground, let's just give Haftan an animo vision. As for weapon, the only reason this is hard is because it's either a sword or a claymore. You really can't tell with his enemy form because that could just be a sword scaled up for the sake of it matching his enemy size. 
Or it could just be a claymore that's a normal size. However, with this one, it actually can be either because it doesn't impact the rest of the moveset. I'm leaning towards Sword because Human Halfdan doesn't look like he'd be much of a claymore guy to be honest. But again, it could work either way. All the changes would be the charged attack. Speaking of which, with all that out of the way, let's look at the Black Serpent Knight for a bit. Based on most of the style of slashes here, Halfdan's charged attack would either be the multiple slashes in place for a sword, or the swinging back and forth style for a claymore. Halfdan's skill would take after the Whirling Wind Blades attack. He just throws out a couple spinning animo blades that then come back to you, dealing animo damage and generating particles. Halfdan's burst, I wanted to be a bit more unique because this isn't just a black serpent knight colon wind cutter, this is Halfdan. The Black Serpent Knight, colon, Wind Cutter. So while his burst is based off of Swift Wind Seekers, it'll be a bit more unique. The Seekers themselves, I imagine, would just work like Ning Guang's burst does. However, because Haftan is a swell dude who gave up his life to help us, he gets a similar supportive flair that I gave Tepe. After Haftan's burst, the whole party gains a slight attack speed boost. On top of that, Whenever one of the Seekers lands, it'll directly regenerate energy for the current character on the field. This means you can act quite quickly out of the burst, and the Seekers will take a little time to actually reach the enemies, so you have some time to switch to someone else if you want them to get the energy instead. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! It's now time for the Sumer character. If you haven't finished the R&R questline, Ar Arena. Arana... Aranyaka... Aranyaka... Aranyaka? Aranyaka. If you haven't finished that, then go ahead and click off. Yes, this is a spoiler for that 10 mile year long quest line, not the main story. So, warning if you haven't finished that. Here she is. The entire reason that I had to say almost every character on this list is dead. Because Rana was not the NPC killed off this time. That honor went to our buddy Arama. Now, besides the fact that I only paid attention half of the time during this quest, and I was constantly confused because every single name for things in this quest sounded almost the same, I actually quite enjoyed this quest. My only real problem with it was that instead of showing us someone getting a vision, the game got to black and text just told us that it was happening. But she's the first NPC we've actually seen fighting by herself and the first to get a vision live on screen. So I was dying to include her in this video, even if she isn't dead. It should be a four star Dendro X. So a lot of people want her to be playable. But on top of having an NPC model, she also uses a weapon that doesn't exist. Which I feel would be a problem for playability. However, since this is all hypothetical anyway, I won't let that stop me here. They probably wouldn't add an axe weapon type. So if she was playable, she might just be a sword user, with her signature weapon being a sword that looks like an axe. I don't know, but uh, let's just say for the sake of simplicity, they make a new special axe class, just for her. Her charge attack would just be a slow diagonal slash with her axe, maybe it could knock enemies up or away, but not too interesting. For her skill, I wanted to incorporate her friend Arana, so she can aim and place down Arana on the field. Originally, I was thinking Arana would be like a combo of Tainari's skill and Kolai's burst, applying continuous AoE Dendro and taunting nearby enemies. But then I realized it'd be a little boring to have this new Dendro idea just be a combination of the only other existing Dendro characters currently. So instead, Arana would be a Dendro Oz. He would do small little bursts of Dendro damage centered on nearby enemies, and it could apply Dendro to other enemies who are close to the attack. On top of that, anytime you create a Dendro reaction while Arana is deployed, Rana, the human, separate character, will gain one stack of purification, maxing at three. I wanted to do something with stacks, since I haven't yet in any other moveset idea I've come up with, and Rana's burst is where the stacks come in. Her burst creates a circle of thorns that'll root enemies in place. 
This route doesn't apply to bosses, but I'm sure you could already guess that since the god of Geo isn't even able to stun bosses either. A wave of purification then pulses out from the center of the thorns, dealing dendro damage to anyone in the thorny area. You get one pulse by default, but for each stack of purification you have, you get an extra pulse. So she really has some good sub-DPS capabilities. Or I guess off-field DPS. It, I don't follow the categories that closely. But I think that'd be a fun, fitting moveset. And now that we're done with that, I can...